Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and we are continuing our Eastern Front week. Joining me today is best-selling author Elizabeth Ween from historical fiction about spies to Star Wars stories. Elizabeth is enthusiastic about bringing uh, young adults to the world of history. Today we are talking about Soviet female pilots based on this wonderful book by my guest. Uh, the links to purchase the book, as always, are in the description below where you'll find links to her website, etc., etc., etc. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to click subscribe. Don't forget the information you need is in the description below, as I just said, and maybe consider becoming a, a patron or a YouTube channel member. But I'm going to bring Elizabeth in now. Good afternoon. How are you today? Hi. I'm um, a bit warm in eastern Pennsylvania and a house with no AC. Oh, okay. But World War Two. We're going to get to World War Two, but massive Star Wars fan. How did you get to write Star Wars fiction? And you and one of the books was was narrated by Kelly Tran, wasn't it? I mean, how the yes, tell us a bit about Star Wars. How cool is that? Um, I I was you know twelve years old. Yeah, twelve years old when Star Wars: A New Hope came out, and I was a fan from day one. And it used to be that whenever anybody asked me um, where I got my ideas, I would sort of facetiously say Star Wars. You know young wonderful female ambassador being interrogated by you know evil sort of pseudo nazi anyway so what happened with my writing the book was um because i had actually written that um uh book about young woman who's a spy and gets captured and interrogated and stuff uh code name verity i kind of made a name for myself as being the person who writes uh, for children and young adults and focuses on uh, particularly women in flight. So um, young women who fly and young women who fly during World War II. And while um, Lucasfilm were working on episode eight, The Last Jedi, they had the you know these bomber squadrons which come in in the very beginning of the movie and and rose uh who was kind of one of the big supporting stars played by kelly marie tran uh is a member of the bomber crew and so is her older sister Paige. and so they wanted a companion novel for the movie aimed at middle grade readers so that's like ages 10 to 12. And apparently they're sitting around saying, you know, well, who could write this? Well, you know, Elizabeth Ween writes books about uh, young women who are flying. You know, maybe she would, maybe we'd get her on board. And they sent a note to my agent and she forwarded it to me very late at night because I live in Scotland. There's a time difference between her and New York. And all she, all she commented was, hmm. And and I thought the subject line was the kind of a long shot. That was the subject line. Mm -hmm. And then this person started talking about episode eight and how cool it would be if we get Elizabeth Wien on board, but maybe we can't afford her. And I was like, who is this? You know, what are they talking about? What do we talk about in terms of episode numbers so casually? And I'm like, could it be Star Wars? Are we up to number eight? Like, oh yeah, we are. And then wow. I saw that the and then I saw that the that the email was from Lucasfilms, the former. Wow, movie. I'd have had a hard time. I, I would have been I was in, inarticulate with wow. excitement. Okay, and the only person awake in the house was my seventeen-year-old son. And I went into the living room and I said, "Star Wars!" Wow. So um, yeah, they they sought me out and they asked me to do it, and I did it. Kelly Marie Tran read, read the audio book, um, which is great. It's got, you know, like John Williams background music. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> oh. like, look at this. How cool is this? I well, you, 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 that was your career highlight, but now you're on World War II TV. So I hope maybe that, you know, <laughs> we live up to the, to the writing for Lucas. But anyway, what an amazing thing. And we'll talk later on, hopefully, about, about how you address bringing history to, to people of a younger age. Because as I said before we went live there, I get zero people under 18 watching World War II TV called Dicks, And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's crusty old men. <laughs> and, and I'm one of them myself talking about World War II. So we'll talk about that later. But... We're going to go back to World War II and Soviet flyers, and you've come with a PowerPoint. And folks, we'll do questions as we go along. 
And I urge you to go and check out Elizabeth's website because there's something there for everybody. I mean, nonfiction, fiction, historical fiction, it's, you've covered it all. And um, yeah, flying seems to be the recurring theme, if I may, it might be so bold. It is the recurring theme. And it, it's really kind of like now what I do. If I, if I try to do a book, fail pilots. Oh. <laughs> So um, to talk about A Thousand Sisters, um, again, like the Star Wars book, this was a book that I was asked to do. And uh, you, anybody who's listening um, may very well have heard of the Night Witches and that it may be a knowledge of them that has actually brought you to this program today. Um, and they certainly are people that I wrote about, uh, but I knew only a little bit about them when I was asked to do this. And my editor had heard of them as well. And she thought, wow, this would be a really cool subject to, to do a book about, you know, Elizabeth Lean, she's the one who writes about young women pilots. I'll see if she's interested. And I was, and it was supposed to be a middle grade book originally. And the more I dug into the information, the more, I realized that there was actually a very, very complicated story to tell. And I ended up telling not just the story of the Night Witches, but of three different regiments, one, one of which became known as the Night Witches. And I will um, unpack that a little bit for you in this talk. But one of the things that I found as I was writing and researching was that I really struggled to get my head around the political background that drove mm. these women to do what they did. And part of the reason it turned into a young adult book and I'm like 400 page book and um, this is a, a book for older readers. And uh, part of the reason that it became a much more complicated story was because I took a long time going into the political background for myself because I wanted to understand these people and I really, really couldn't. And indeed, one of them, one of them commented about her own generation. We are a generation not of this universe. It's so difficult to understand what it was like growing up in Stalinist Russia during the Great Terror and, and the, the various famines and the five-year plans in the 1930s. And so, believe it or not, in order to get my head around why there were female combat pilots in the Soviet Union, I found I had to really understand like the birth of the Soviet Union as well. So there is a bit of that in the beginning of the book. It kind of, the, the women who do the flying in World War II grow up with the Soviet Union. They're, they're all more or less born around the time of the Revo Russian Revolution uh, or the Russian Civil War just after. And they always imagined that they were gonna go to war. But there are other like interesting things going on as well because of course uh, the US and the Soviet Union became allies during World War II. And I really found that the US was really aware of these women and what they were doing. Um, and as the war went on, they became more and more aware of them. Uh, so I'm gonna read you just the first paragraph of this book, um, because this was, this was a hook that we worked on real, real hard because it's aimed at young readers. And we wanted my editor and I, she was really, really involved in the crafting of this novel, though I was the one who wrote it and researched it. And we wanted to have an opening that young readers could relate to. And as I say, relating to these young people was really, really hard. So, so this, is, this is how it opens. Um, yeah. it, the, the prologue is called Battle Cry. Imagine a blockbuster movie about a world united in battle against Nazi oppression. In this sweeping international epic, Black and white American soldiers protect each other under enemy fire in the African desert. 
A Chinese grandmother leads an army of 30,000 guerrilla warriors against Japanese invaders. A beautiful French spy escapes murderous Gestapo agents in Paris. In the North Sea, British Navy sailors brave a suicide mission against enemy submarines. A starving Greek community defies Nazi soldiers by hanging out thousands of forbidden national flags. And in the fiery skies above Russia, women drop bombs and fly fighter planes in aerial combat against German pilots. This is the outline for Battle Cry, a movie optioned for Hollywood by director Howard Hawks in the middle of World War II. And what happened with this with this film was uh, Hawks Howard hired William Faulkner to write the screenplay, which he did. So he went out to Hollywood in July of 1943 and worked on this screenplay. And I found out when I was, and so, we, you know, we were sort of like set the scene here then with talking about what Hollywood was like in 1943 and a little bit about the filming of this because the only scene that ever got filmed was like a burning wheat field. So the, the, um, the script exists and it's got this fantastic sequence in it with um, these amazing women pilots in the Soviet Union, but the film never actually got made. And what I then did was I contrasted what was going on in Hollywood as um, they were working on this film with what was actually going on at exactly the same time in the awesome. Soviet Union. One of these young pilots was 21-year-old Lilia Litviak. During the last week of July in 1943, while they were filming, Literally on the other side of the world from California, Lilia was fighting for her life in the Battle of Stalingrad. Lilia was an eccentric beauty, a petite blonde who regularly sent her aircraft mechanic to pick up peroxide from a nearby hospital so she could bleach her hair. She flew combat missions with little bouquets of flowers stuck on her dashboard, but she was a deadly foe in the air. For nearly a year, Lilia had been flying for the Soviet Air Force in a single seat fighter plane called a Yak one. Now, if I learned anything from writing Codename Verity, it was that um, young readers, for the most part, really aren't interested in aircraft types. So we, so we were very, very, we really pulled back a lot on um, describing the planes that these pilots used. But anyway, that that was how how we kind of like mm. opened the book with this. You know, here's here's a, a twenty one year old girl who's a she's already a double ace by that time she's shot down 11 enemy aircraft and an observation balloon with balloon which was on the other side of enemy lines so she had to devise a special plan for for shooting it down and you know this is at a time when nobody else in the world had women flying in combat so that's the introduction you get if you're a young reader and you're reading this. But what I'm just gonna um, talk you through in this slideshow um, is um, a bit more visually entertaining. There are, someone has gone out and colorized a whole bunch of pictures of these women. So there are some really, really beautiful shots of them in photographs that really should be in black and white. And that's the interesting thing, Elizabeth, is that we, we will talk about later on is the night witches are, They've been video games, comics. Yeah. There's YouTube programs about that are all about the aircraft. Which type of aircraft? They when do they change from the Yak yeah. One Mark Three to yeah, Mark Four? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's ones about the whole the sexy young flyers and that. Kind of, there's so many ways of coming at this story yeah. as there were at the time, both both Soviet propaganda and as you said there, the fact that Hollywood was looking at it to to bolster U.S. America, you know, the Soviet yeah. relations. It's a story that can be told in very different ways, but the, the important thing is, is who were these people? So here's who they were. Um, Marina Roskova is the woman who was completely responsible for getting these women into the air. She was born in 1912 and she, what she actually wanted to be an opera singer and uh she had an inner ear infection when she was 15 years old and it 
basically ruined her for music. So she studied chemistry and she got a job uh, in a technical factory. And eventually she was at a pretty young age was calibrating navigation instruments. And as a result of working with these navigation instruments and working very closely um, with a guy who was involved in a lot of um, early navigation flights, she became a navigator. She became the first woman to actually uh, graduate with a navigation degree in Soviet Union. And that made the American newspapers when it happened. And so she started learning to fly because she was also, you know, involved in a lot of quite record breaking navigational flights. And she was invited to come along I, I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping I know what my next slide is. Yeah, I do. She was invited to come along on this absolutely record smashing distance flight um, in the plane that you see behind there. The Rodina is um, it's it's Russian for for mother motherland. And she was invited to come along. She'd, she'd flown before with uh, the co-pilot, Polina Osipenko, and uh, Valentina Grzydobova, the pilot, had also done a ton of record-breaking flights as well. So this was this was like a really, really impressive e event for her to be involved in. And kind of from the start, it was a great big disaster. Um, it was scheduled to start, oh God, a, it's been so long since I wrote this, I can't remember the year. I think it was 38. Yeah, it was scheduled to start on September 20, uh, in September 1938. And Marina had appendicitis and uh, they had to postpone it. And the thing is they couldn't really postpone it much longer than September because they were tr going to be flying from Moscow to the farthest east of Siberia and it was gonna be too cold for them to go. So they pushed it back as far as they could. And then Stalin was like, right, off you go. So they did. And they ended up running out of gas. Possibly it was sabotage. Uh, it was, it was sketchy. The gas, the, the, the fuel tanks had been sealed because they weren't supposed to land and top them up. And apparently they hadn't like filled them as full as they were supposed to. But anyway, they, they ran out of fuel about an hour short of their like 24 hour flight. And they ended up um, having to ditch in the, well, not ditch. Um, they ended up having to crash land in um, the Siberian forest. And because Marina was the navigator, she was sort of, hold up in the nose, you can see the nose of this aircraft in this slide. And procedure for uh, an emergency landing for this particular one of a kind aircraft was for the navigator to parachute out because it was bound to a crash landing would very likely crush the navigators if it, if it landed nose forward. So she did, she parachuted out into the, into the, the snow forest and, and, uh, Valentina and Polina went on a bit further and, and crash landed it, but they were separated. And so Marina survived, I think it was like nine days in the, in the wilderness on, on a half a packet of mints and some cranberries that she found, you know, and she had an encounter with a bear, which she scared off with her gun. And she finally um, caught up with them. And in the meantime, this huge search and rescue operation had been launched and sick, they found them but they couldn't land to get to them. And there was a, among the people flying around, there was a midair collision and 16 people were killed in the rescuers. And they kept that real, real, real quiet because this was supposed to be a big deal. And eventually they got all these people back to Moscow and they made a huge celebration out of it. They'd smashed the women's long distance record to smithereens. You know, they'd flown like twice as far as anybody else had ever flown. And they became national celebrities. And Marina wrote a book and young women all over the Soviet Union wrote to her and said, we love you, we love you, you know, you're our hero. And they carried pictures of her in their school bags. And 
the thing you have to understand in 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 the um, in the meantime is that of all the the weird things about the Soviet Union in its in its youth and about Stalin and his paranoia and and the, the many people that he was you know sort of killing and sending off to gulags and everything, they in the in the 1936 Constitution they they said you know boys and girls have to be educated equally and so they did. And these kids who were raised thinking that they were going to have to go fight for their country and, and they had to be involved and in, you were required to be involved in paramilitary activities after school, they, the, the boys and the girls were pretty much actually educated the same. And so girls were encouraged to join in in the same paramilitary after school activities as boys were so they, you know, could learn to fire rifles. I believe they all learned to fire rifles, but they could get better at that, or they could do parachute jumps, or they could learn to fly. And many girls did. And uh, in the late 1930s, and this statistic really blows my mind, there were a about a third of licensed pilots in the Soviet Union were, were women. That's so, astonishing. I mean, yeah. that, that would be astonishing today, I think, yeah. <laughs> back in yeah. the 1930s. It's, that's it is, it's an astonishing statistic. Um, I mean, it's, it's nowhere near that today anywhere. It's, it's you know, maybe 10% at best, depending mm. on where you are. So, yeah, that, so there were loads and loads of young women out there who... who did learn to fly and of course they were it, this is this is kirov the guy uh, he was St stalin's best friend um and he also was murdered by a gunman standing outside his office um and we don't know if maybe stalin ordered that or if it was genuine but he, the reason the whole great terror and the, and the purges started was because he was initially um looking for revenge for Kirov's death. And all, all the kids loved Kirov. He was very, very charismatic. And yeah. and um, so anyway, there he is. And that's just giving you an idea of, you know, the way these kids would be would be standing by the Neva saluting him, you know, as he as he as he walked by. And look at the one on the right who's just come from fishing and, and they're all, you know, just so healthy and 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 patriotic. So when at when war started, they wanted to join. And there was nothing available for for girls who wanted to fly. Everybody, you know, the Germans, I, I'm, I'm assuming I'm, I'm, you know, talking to people who kind of know this history already. Yeah, we're, they're pretty good this lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But when uh, you know, the Germans suddenly betrayed them and went from being their allies to um, invading their country, uh, all over the country, girls who had been raised thinking that they were going to fight another war, a, a, a war like their parents had fought, thinking that they were going to defend their country, they ran to the recruiting centers with boys. And although the military didn't have anything against girls signing up, they didn't actually have anything in place to deal with them. So you were required to join the military if you were a boy, but you were required to if you were a girl. And they there was like no system in place to deal with them. And what the, what ended up happening was they got turned away. So they all, these girls who, who had pilot's license and they knew they had a skill that they could use to help defend their country, um, they wrote to Marina Roskova. And she, uh, for various reasons, seems to have had Stalin's ear. And she went to him and she said, please, 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 can we start a women's regiment? And she got permission to do it. Uh, Lilia Litviak, who um, I talked to a little bit about earlier, was one of these girls. She was a flight instructor um, She at the, at the time. And uh, she was she was turned away as well. They were all kind of told, you know, oh, you can go and train people. We, we're going to need girls to train people. And she was like, no, I want to be a fighter pilot. <laughs> and a, a, a young 
you know, student pilot in typical small plane. Right. What happened was she got these three. Marina had Stalin's ear. She got these. She got um, him to agree to a regiment of women and they formed the 122nd Air Group. It was all the signups were all by word of mouth. And it happened at around the time that. Moscow was expecting to be invaded. So October of 1941. And basically a bunch of phone calls were made and they said, if you know anyone, uh, let them know, call them up, get people to sign up. And so these girls all came into Moscow, hoping that they were going to join Marina's new regiment. And uh, she interviewed everybody and she, you know, she chose some of them and some of them apparently, you know, she wasn't able to take on. But by the, in two weeks, they'd come up with about a thousand people that they were going to train. And at that point, they evacuated Moscow. And so it was just like, boom, 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 you went from being a civilian to being in the military almost immediately. Now this picture that you're looking at is the night witches because what um, Marina actually ended up doing was she had three different regiments. One of them, uh, they, were, they were the 586th, the 587th and the 588th originally. And one of them was going to be a squadron of fighter pilots. One was gonna be a squadron of dive bombers and one was going to be a squadron of night bombers and the night bombers the 588 are the ones that everybody's heard of as the as the um, night witches and they all were going to fly different aircraft this picture was taken of those who were going to join the night bombers um before they actually um had cut their hair one of the things that they had to do uh, you know, as they were getting ready to join the military was they had to, they were all issued with men's uniforms and they all had to get men's haircuts. And it was really traumatic. And I love this picture because you can see their, their long braids. It was, it was very typical at the time, very fashionable for girls to wear these, you know, long braids and crowns around their head. And they all had to get their hair cut off. And Lilia, who is sitting in this, can I point to this? No, you have to describe, okay. I'm afraid. Yeah. All right. No, no, that's okay. Lilia is second from the left in the front row. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and she was just like refused to do it. And Marina took her side and said, look, you have to do this for your country, da, da, da. But she was, she was just a little sort of spitfire of a girl. And she, uh, when they were issued with their, with their men's uniform and their men's boots, she took the, some of you probably know this already, but she um, took the, goldskin lining out of the boots and sewed it onto her her coat as a as a collar and so when they lined up the next day uh there she was wearing this lovely collar and marina again was like oh, really you know what is that it's a goatskin collar doesn't it suit me yes but you need to take it off and put it back in your boots because it's more important that your feet be warm than that you look fashionable and and just to interrupt, Lisa is asking about the reason to cut the girl's hair, because when we had Luba on talking about the avenging angels or snipers, she was saying there was a bit of a debate as to whether it was some of the women themselves instigating it because it would desexualize their appearance to, to, to kind of prevent the the sexual tension, because we know that rape and abuse. Yeah, is I don't think there was a reason. I think it was like, right, you're all getting military haircuts. Um, certainly the way they talk about it, none of them, and we're very lucky in that a lot of them, um, when, after Stalin died and things started lightening up, a lot of them wrote memoirs or gave interviews. And we have a lot of personal histories from the, from the survivors of these women. And they all just basically say, oh, they made us get military haircuts and we all look like boys and we hated it. Um, it 
I think it was more to make them uniform. Again, kind of a Soviet thing that I think is very hard for yeah, us. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's certainly plausible. But I can also see the point that there was some deliberate attempt to, to, to take away their attractiveness because they're going to yeah. be going into an environment yeah. where, you know. Yeah. I mean, they were not, they were, it was never intended that they were going to be in, in a male environment. And yeah. the, the Night Witches, the 588, indeed, was entirely female, entirely run by females, the armorers, the mechanics, um, you know, the pilots and navigators, the, the um, officers, completely female throughout the entire war. And uh, the other two, the other two uh, regiments did have men working with them, but the, the, there was sexual tension, but it usually came from other reg regiments that they had to work with, or more often from higher in commands in other regiments. So you know they would get they would get propositioned by some some mm. bigwig that would come in that they would they would have to meet. And, and there the was question I'll let you go back to you is, is is how were people selected for one of these three different roles? Was it was it based on you know the random you know you there you there you there or was yeah. there some kind of action no it was there were so many women and they all wanted to be fighter pilots cool. and. Marina, again, was in charge of organizing it. So she, she interviewed everybody personally. A lot of this she did on the train that they took to Engels, where they would be training, which was like a nine hour train. So they were all evacuated from Moscow along with everybody else. And they had this, was it nine? I think it was a nine day train ride. Um, and so they chundering away. And she came through and she spoke to everybody and she she had some requirements because a lot of them were college educated or were in the process of getting an education. So the ones who had the most flying hours were, you know, sort of prioritized as pilots. The ones who had been maybe studying physics or chemistry in school were given jobs as um, navigators. And then she also had to have mechanics and some of the, some of the, and of course, then within that, not every, the, even the pilots were not all going to get to be fighter pilots. Yeah, yeah. And some of them, probably most of them were bitterly, bitterly disappointed. But again, this woman was like, this is what you're doing for your country. What you're doing is just as important. If you're a parachute packer, you're going to save the lives of, of one of these pilots one day. The, the um, I, the night, which is again, the 588th were like different from everybody else. They flew without parachutes. The others, the other two regiments did use parachutes. Um, the the t ridiculous planes, I should, um, I should move on. So we see <laughs> pictures of their planes, but the, the planes that the, that the 588 flew, the night bombers, they were basically, here they are, same group in their, in their uniforms. Um, with their men's haircuts. And let me see if I can point out to you some of the, um, some of the same people. Well, the one in the front, um, the, the, the woman who is um, sitting in the front uh, kind of, if you see there's two there right in the front, the one on the right who actually looks like a very handsome youth. She's Yeah, yeah. I thought that was a bloke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's Yevdokia Vershinskaya and she was actually the um the leader of the group. She she was she was the commander of of the unit and they absolutely adored her. Uh is there someone in there who is I, I, unfortunately, this is actually too small for me to, to properly see. But trust, no me, trust me, quite a few of these people in their summer dresses with their with their long braids are now definitely a very country. different feel. It's reminding yeah. me more of the yeah. kind of East European, um, you know, uh, Olympic teams of the nineteen seventies. You right. know, that very yeah, butch right. looking. But, but and yeah, actually, a lot of them, uh, uh, many of them, grew their hair back. Um, mm. And so when you, because they, they never, they never made them get their hair cut again. And uh, when you see them in later, in later photographs, that's just the Neva in winter. It, it, they, it, when you see them in, let me finish my one thought there. When you see them in later photographs, they have, they have kind of like attractive little bobs. The, their hair right. isn't super long, but they look more feminine than, than they do in that first photograph. Um, the 
conditions in Engel, the, the Engels, the winter of 1941 to 42 was the coldest winter globally, like on record ever. And the average temperature in Engels where they were training, the average temperature between November and February was three degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is, uh, oh, I don't know, it's minus 15 or something yeah, like that. that. Minus 15, yeah, that's, that's yeah. cold. That's cold. Yeah, yeah. no, that's the average temperature between November and February. And they're flying, the, all of them were training in open cockpit planes. Um, so yeah, there they are in their, in their winter flying gear. Um, well, and they trained, they trained for a good long time. They trained for, um, six months. They basically had to get all their military training in before, um, they would, before they became operational. That was it compressed training. Cause Gary August is watching and saying it, it, was, it was about compressed. six months because I can, I've said again, I've read things saying they were given a shorter training, but then if they are college educated, if a third of them have been, you know, some of them have been flying before, then flying. It, it makes yeah. sense, you know. No, no, I mean, they had, they had, they had way more training than a bunch of Spitfire pilots. Yeah. You know? okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so there's a, there's a face mask such as they would be wearing, um, so that they wouldn't get frostbitten faces while they're training. Another quick thing, and I'll let you go back to you, is were there any height and weight requirements? You know, because of if within, the, I don't know whether they were for men either, but what, were there any that you discovered? I, I did not discover height and weight requirements, but I will comment that um, for the people who were going to be flying the dive bombers, they had a tail gunner and the women it was a job that most women couldn't do because they didn't have the upper body strength to load the gun in the machine gun in flight. And there, there were a couple of them from, from this group that became tail gunners in the, in the, in the um, PE twos that they flew, but they ended up integrating those crews because they needed men as tail gunners. Um, and, and most of the tail gunners, the crew of three, most of the tail gunners were men. So they, you know, obviously they were different. And, and Lilia was, she was not tall. She was, she was like five, four or something like that, you know. So they're, what, the, back to their boots, the boots, the men's boots that they were issued. Apparently, like when they were, when they were training, there's one, one, young woman was standing in her boots and they were told to make a sharp right turn, standing turn. And she turned to the right and, and her boots stayed facing forward because her feet were so small inside them. Um, so I am unaware there may have been requirements. I kind of don't think there were, you know, I mean, I, I'm the Soviet Union's one resource was manpower. Yeah. You know, yeah. and and I, I think that for the most part, they just took whatever they could get and kept throwing it against yeah. Makes the, sense. the Nazi forces. So uh, this is again is showing you the, the what the circumstances under which they were they were training. They they got these these um, yak ones, uh, which were the first the first aircraft that the, that the fighter pilots were um, were flying in, and that one is there on skis. They had to basically park them on a bed of pine branches um, overnight or else they'd end up um, freezing to the ground overnight. The, the mechanics who were working on these planes, uh, they're, they're, a lot of the stuff that they were doing, they couldn't do in gloves and their fingers would stick to the instruments and, you know, skin would pull off. And they were all just like, everybody was like super intense about doing their job. They, I don't think we can understand the the patriotism that that these guys felt in, in the defense of their country. I don't know. I find it. I struggle to understand it. PE twos were what the dive bombers were flying. These are the ones I'm t I was talking about that have um, a, a tail gunner. And again, th there was a bit of an issue with um, with the smaller size of of women as pilots. They couldn't, I'm going to forget this, but it was something like they couldn't actually reach the rudder pedals properly for 
takeoff so the um navigator would stand behind in the pilot seat and brace herself against the pilot seat to give her a little bit of extra push forward so that so that she could um do the takeoff properly um these the three different groups were led by three different people and marina ruskova was supposed to lead the um dive bombers the 587th and they did not become operational because they had they had brand new and much more complicated aircraft than anyone else who was flying and so they did not become operational until january of 1943 and Marina ended up uh, dying in a crash as she was flying one of these aircraft to join the rest of the squadron um, over the, the over New Year's, and basically continued flying into bad weather, classic pilot error, and was killed along with. Uh, her navigator and another guy who'd come along um, for the ride. So they started, they had to start flying their combat missions two weeks later and everybody was absolutely devastated. They had been with this young woman who'd been like their mother and their sister and their commander and, and their adored folk hero. And um, they'd been training with her for well over a year now. And suddenly she was gone. And they were assigned a man who was kind of like, it feels a little bit like he was given this job because he, uh, he was being punished. Maybe he had um, defied orders to, um, he he defied some command orders to go ahead with, with a mission and as a pilot, he decided that like he was risking pe people's lives in order to do it. And so they were like, mm -mm, maybe we're gonna take you off that and um, you can go and lead this group of women. Um, his name was um, Valentin Markov. Right. And they ended up, they flew their first missions under him and they were all like, whoa, 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 now we have a man leading us, this sucks. We were gonna be, we were gonna be all women's and our commander is dead. And they ended up really loving him. He, he, he just was great at boosting their morale. And they ended up calling him, you know, Papa. He was, he was their dad. He was like seven years older than the oldest of them. But, but they really proved themselves in combat as did the famed night witches. Now the planes that they were flying, these, these Polikarpov um, twos or their other, I don't remember their original name, uh, the U2. Um, they were crop dusters, they were classic trainers and they were of course the aircraft that the Soviets had the most of. There, there were yep. loads and loads of them. And there were actually hundreds of squadrons doing exactly the same work that these women were doing. Part of the myth is that they would like the Soviets gave the, the, the higher ups gave them these crappy planes because they were women. That's not the case. There, there were plenty of men flying these exact same planes and flying the same kind of harassment missions that these women were, were flying. And basically what they did was they followed the front throughout the war and all night long dropped bombs on the German troops. So the idea, they didn't do that much damage, but the idea was that they were lowering German morale. They were making it really, really difficult for them to get any sleep. They were destroying their, their supply dumps, you know? So, so they were just like this constant battle against these like annoying little planes that kept coming in. And, um, and this may be a good point to mention it coming up in the sidebar about the propaganda that was happening at the time and, and, you know, how the, 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 the press are making a big thing about the, the night witches, the female pilots, but some of the male pilots were, do, as you say, were, the, were doing the same job. H how did you unravel the, the truth of well, the their press, popularity? The, the press, as far as I can tell, was, was um, they were, they were real pleased that they had female pilots doing all kinds of things. I mean, they, they, they were, so for example, example, Lilia Litviak, who was in the, the, um, this isn't a very linear narrative. <laughs> who yeah, was in, I'm loving it. Who was in the um, the 
fighter squadron, the, the 586th, she uh, shot down, she became the first woman to uh, shoot down an aircraft in combat. And I think, <laughs> and she was hugely lauded for this. Like she, she was, she was in all the newspapers and everything. And they, um, the 587th, I've got a couple, let me just skip ahead here. DDD, don't look. <laughs> Where are they? Oh, maybe I haven't. Well, anyway, the 587th um, had a couple of women who were involved in a, a, a flight formation um, that they called a fist, where they had nine aircraft and they stayed together despite the fact that they were like losing engines and getting fired on and everything. The fact that they stayed together meant that they all actually survived an attack against dozens of German fighter aircraft because they were able to defend each other. If one of them had peeled away, it would have been, they would have been easy bait. And that made it into the American newspapers. Mm. That feat, those two, they were called junior officers, but those two women were mentioned by name in American newspapers throughout the country. So the, the propaganda, when I actually started looking at the propaganda of the time, it certainly was not saying that, that these women were um, doing anything different to the men, but more that, look how wonderful our women are. And what happened with the night, which is what made them different, is, I mean, it is, I think, a truth that women organize themselves more socially than men do when they are all together um, as, as a group. And so they were actually approaching some of the problems that they were running into in a kind of, you know, communal way. And uh, one of the things um, that they discovered, so these, these night bombing flights, they would, they would spend the night at what they called an intermediate airfield. And that airfield would be about a 15 minute flight from the front, but they could disguise it because there was, there was no equipment there. Um, they would drive the fuel trucks there under cover of darkness so that they could refuel aircraft. They would use torches as landing lights. So there were, there were no barracks. There was, there were no machine shops. There was, you know, there was nothing there except, except the airfield. And they were split up into um, groups who were, they were supposed, there was, there was one person who was supposed to work as the mechanic and one person who was supposed to work as the uh, refueler and, you know, one person who was supposed to, um, I don't know, give a cup of tea or whatever to the, to the navigator and the pilot. They, they, they have a crew of two, these planes. And one person who's supposed to load the new bombs on because 15 minutes to the front, they'd go, they'd fly out, fly back, reload, fly out, fly back. Um, on their, what they called their maximum nights, they would fly like 20 missions. Um, pretty average was 10 in, in a night. And they felt that they could better organize themselves if all the, all the armorers would do each plane as it landed and all the mechanics did each plane as it landed. And as a result, instead of waiting for, you know, your assigned plane to come in, as a result, they be, they were actually very, very efficient. And Yevdokia Berzhenskaya told some official about this, suggesting that other people take up this um, system. And instead of other people taking up this system, they got told off for going against regulations. So they decided that next time they made any changes, they weren't going to tell anybody. They would just go ahead and do them. And how they made their reputation. So they were flying actually more missions. As a result of their efficiency, they were flying more missions per night 
than most of the men's groups, I think, than any of the men's groups, because they had managed to work out how to get the most out of their out of um, their aircraft and their and their air crew. They had on the 31st of July, 1943, they had a really, really bad night. And uh, they ran into a, because they flew out in a line two or three minutes apart, they were kind of predictable. And there was a, they ran into a night fighter, Messerschmitt um, 110, who basically sat up there and just picked them off. And they lost four planes that night out of, out of like, Eight. like ridiculous they they hadn't had that many losses before and suddenly they were eight flight crew down and it was absolutely tragic for them of course they're all up there in the air and these planes which are basically balsa wood and fabric would just go up like a matchstick when when you know tracer hit it and they in the aftermath of this, decided that they were going to change their tactics. And the tactics that they decided on was what they're known for, which was one of them would go in first as kind of bait and would play, dance around in the searchlights that were looking for these aircraft and would um, dodge and weave while the other one would cut the engine glide down to 600 feet and drop their bombs. And then they would swap roles instead of going, you know, one after the other and dropping their bombs. And it was this strategy that earned them their name when they were, when they were swooping down with the engine cut. They could, you know, they could actually hear the Germans saying, oh, my God, the women are in the air again. They sometimes heard them on their radio. Um, and they became really very revered and hated. And so that was that was when they, they started the it was the German troops that named them the Nachtex. And I'm glad you explained this, this, the story about the efficiency of the ground crews and the turnaround of the aircraft and this this system with the airfields being you know, 15 minutes away from the front, because. Again, some of the stuff you read online is that there's almost like this sort of magical quality these these females have. That there's something that it's it's all just because of their I don't know their innate feminine hormonal instinct or something. And I'm glad you're actually explaining that it's actually based on thorough understanding of the situation, yeah. efficiency, and working together because it's a better story than picturing some kind of you know special belief they have that that you can't put your finger on. No, no, no. It was all, it is um, all of them. And, and here are some of these wonderful colorized pictures of them. This is, this is also the, the uh, 588th who eventually were um, honored with the title 46 guards um, for, for the amazing work that they had done. They became a, a it's an honorific to be a, a guards squadron. Um, and there they are with their planes in the background. Um but yeah, I mean, they are, they are just like, they, when you read their individual memoirs, they really are very relatable young women with hopes that some of them were mothers. Some of them had, one of them heartbreakingly had a three-year-old that she left with, um, with her, I think her mother-in-law. Um, and after the war was over and she went back to, to, try to retrieve this child her 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 in-laws said no you can't have this this isn't your daughter you went off to war you you're not a mother you have no maternal instinct and she and you know she's like well, i was crying every night because my three-year-old was <laughs> elsewhere and i was fighting for her country you know so the, the 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 patriotism was very much like it's unnatural for for women to fight but we have to defend our land for our children and for, you know, it's our home and it needs defending. I, they, I'm not saying I subscribe to this. I'm saying this was very much what they seem to have believed. This is just a nice picture of the um, 586th. Looking at some flight planning here, the woman on the left is Lilia. Um, the woman in the middle is Katya Budunova, who is her um, best friend and her wingman. And um, 
yeah, there's an artist's impression of a, a, a yak one flying over the, the Battle of Stalingrad. The 586th, Lilia and, and, and um, Katya were actually transferred out of it. It was the, it was the least successful of the, um, of the three regiments. Um, and that's partly because there were some command issues in it. The women did not really get along with um, their commander. And very early on, one of them, while they were still training, one of their members sh shot herself after crash landing in a field because she was so worried she was flying someone else's plane and she was apparently so worried that this person was going to be mad at her. So like, you know, I mean, you can imagine what it would do to your, to your squadron if you had this kind of weird stuff going on um, that you're trying to deal with. And uh, Lilia and Katya and uh, a couple of other women really, really did not get along with the commander at all. And they ended up being transferred into an all male squadron. Um, where they flew for most of the war, or for at least until they were killed anyway. Um, so yeah, that's the, the 586th. Um, they did eventually, um, in this squadron, they had men joining the squadron as well. So there were a few aircraft that were being flown by men as well as women. And uh, apparently this is why, one of the reasons why they would put f bouquets of flowers on their wings, because it would like designate the plane as this is, this is a woman's plane, you know, don't you, don't you fly this one. And they were quite proud to be women who were, who were doing this fighting. Um, they also allegedly painted um, a, like a white stripe on their wing to show that they were women. And it was not to be like, oh, I'm in the air, look after me. It was like, ha, this plane is being flown by a woman. Um, and this is uh, the Pittsburgh press, obviously. And just again, showing you how um, much the US was uh, was paying attention to what was going on. This is when uh, Marina Roskova uh, crashed and lost her life um, in January of 1943. And there she is with her your face on the front page of the Pittsburgh press, which I just, this is like two weeks after it happened. It wasn't very long, you know, it, the US knew what was going on out there. That is a picture of her grave. She's next to, buried next to Polina Osipenko. It was a, she had a state funeral. Stalin was one of her pallbearers. I mean, she was a big deal. And that's again the 586th posing for the for the Russian press, basically. And this is this is a little photograph of the. Um, I told you that that, that the um, a couple of women were named mentioned by name um, after a particularly big battle, air battle, and that's an article one from the. Philadelphia Inquirer and another from the Uniontown PA Morning Herald uh, showing um, these articles published in it. Uh, this is a this is one of the PE2 pilots and, and she was um, one whose plane was in that that nine aircraft formation, the fist formation I was telling you about, who um, managed to make it back. She ended up crash landing. Her plane was in flames. She and her uh, she and her navigator couldn't get out of the cockpit and the tail gunner managed to get out and like broke the cockpit open with a hammer. And they all, first thing they did whenever they did a crash landing was they went and reported their plane. They were so worried about saving their planes. And um, they all, you know, sort of turned up in the next couple of days back at base and everybody was so happy to see them because they, you know, thought they were dead. And one more, one more shot of the wonderful Lilia Litvak who was, who vanished. She was sort of last seen being chased by a bunch of Messerschmitts and was not found for 50 years. And under Stalin's regime, if you were not found you were soon to have defected. Yeah, oh, right. And, and it was just like they they would do anything not to land behind enemy lines. 
they would go down in a burning plane not to land behind enemy lines because under order 227, which came out in the middle of the war when they were actually losing very badly, it was called not one step back. It basically became illegal to retreat. And the example I give to kids to try to, to try to push home what this meant was imagine you're a firefighter and it is your job to go into burning buildings and rescue people. But if you can't get into that burning building, you'll be shot because you didn't try. If you do go into that burning building and you're burnt up to death and you don't come out, it will be assumed that you tried to get out. So your family will get no compensation. Wow, that's a, that's a that's a frightening analogy there, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. So so it, they they just like they would do anything, not to not to disappear, uh, fail to return, um, and not to come down be behind enemy lines. If you were made a prisoner of war, you were deemed to have given yourself up. You were deemed to have become a traitor. It was just automatic. So, so that, yeah, that's, that's a, if you if you if you don't if you get captured, you're a traitor. But what? How did the Germans treat them? Because that was a question we had from Leslie early on. How, how many were shot down and captured, and how were they treated? If not a whole lot. Not a whole lot were shot down and captured. Um, there were some. Um, the one that I know of uh, was a, a PE two navigator at, and her. She was shot down and was trying to escape with her tail gunner. I think they might have parachuted out. And so she and her tail gunner were caught more or less together. Her tail gunner was, was male. Um, and so they were separated. And she was sent to a concentration camp. She was sent to Buchenwald um, because there were no prisoner of war camps for women. And so, you know, she was treated like a concentration camp prisoner. She was not given, I think, any, she didn't, I mean, I don't know if they sexually abused her or anything like that. That's not what her, she reported. She basically reported, I was sent to Buchenwald and it was hell, which it was for everybody who was there. Um, so that's kind of what they did, you know, and this is like what you would expect them to do, basically. They mm -hmm. didn't they struggled with, with women because there were a lot of women fighting in the Red Army as well. And the Germans, when they captured them, really just were kind of at a loss as to what to do with them. Um, and they mostly ended up in concentration camps. A lot of them ended up in the women's concentration camp at Ravensbrück. Okay. Well, doing, well, I know you're going to wrap up in a minute, but we'll do a few questions while we have this. So um, Leslie is also asking, what was the highest rank any of these women reached? I believe it was major. Uh, well, so that was Major Marina Roskova. Um, but my understanding of um, Soviet military rankings is... Eh, eh, eh. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to get beyond. You start getting into the the general officer's ranks and it would be, it would have been difficult to get to that there. But thanks for that. Um, Gary August is asking, which heroine flew the most sorties? And we could die that, do that by ooh, regiment. Ooh, ooh. Okay, oh. so I have, a, I have a, a bunch of statistics here. They, um, so I don't know which one flew the most sorties, but here's an example. Um, and again, this is the, the 46 guards, the 588, the night witches, the, the, those, you know, the, that regiment. Mar Maria Smirnova flew five, uh, sorry, 935 harassment missions during the war. That's between 1943, 43, 42, when they became operational, and 45, 935 harassment missions. She estimated that every one of the pilots in that regiment made at least 800 combat flights. So a lot, okay? Um, together total in the three years that that regiment flew on the front lines, they made more than 24,000 combat missions. I mean, it's just mind boggling. There were really only about 30 aircraft flying at any one time a night. You know, it wasn't like there were hundreds and hundreds of aircraft flying. So, I mean, they were, they, she says, 
on their maximum night, they might make between 12 to 18 bombing runs in a single evening, in a single evening. And 24 of them became heroes of the Soviet Union. So they really were, they, they really were lauded. Do you know, the, um, I'll, I'll sort of I'll sort of finish on this note. I have this. This is them at a, at, at one of their companions' funeral. Po twos in flight. But what I want to and give Dahlia Brzezinskaya again. She was their commander for the entire war. What I want to that's her, you know, doing a prep for a mission, briefing for a mission. There's a, another Po two in flight. A couple of um, night witches um, in there with their aircraft, but I wanted to get to this picture. Oh. Um, this is, the woman on the right there is Natalia Mecklen, and she is in this picture. She's the woman second from the left. And this is actually my favorite picture of these ladies. I just love to think, you know, women were flying 18 combat missions a night. And here they are looking like, you know, you're, you're the next river. <laughs> You know, the reason is, and this is what I wanted to kind of finish up with, um, the reason is they were basically all told when the war ended, don't talk about what you've done. Your women, you should be having babies and raising families. Go home and do that. Yeah, it was exactly the same with the snipers. Luba said the same thing when to the show there. It was like, yeah, thank you very much, but now piss off back home and don't talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. And... It was really, again, as I say, only um, after S Stalin passed out of the picture um, that they started going, oh, I don't know, we actually, and they, they had, there was no like formal recognition of them. So they would go on their reunion day, which is, which is May 8th, the, the um, you know, anniversary of the um, uh, end of yep. the war in Europe they would go and have their own sort of reunion and they would wear their medals and you could see they're wearing their medals in this picture. And, and they would afterwards, they'd go and have a meal together and drink vodka and toast their, their dead companions. And they, they continue to do this um, until while I, when I was writing this book, there was still a couple of them still alive. Um, I don't think that any of them are alive anymore because they'd be like a hundred. <laughs> But um, they 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 fated themselves, mm. um, and which I kind of love. And one of them, um, and I think it's the lady on the the left here, whose name I will give you. Um, I apologize for not knowing their names off by heart. I mean, it, it, there's no problem, and the fact you're, you're you're slinging out those pronunciations without any uh, problems is is impressive <laughs> as well. So it's the lady in the middle, the the, bl the blonde looking one, is. Um, Yevgenia Zigilenko, and she became a uh, filmmaker, and she made a short. It's not a short film; it's like forty-five minutes, but it's a you know feature film, um, fictionalized, which was available uh, five years ago on Amazon with subtitles. Um, but she made a film about the Night Witches. I, called something like night witches or or yeah or, i think i think I, I think i've seen it i think i've seen yeah. i've seen it listed yeah, yeah, no, yeah and it's actually it's actually really good in terms of the vibe it gives so obviously all the all the um young women in the film are actresses but there are a bunch of different threads and there's you know one one woman who's had a baby and one woman who's in the hospital and she sneaks out because she wants to get back to her regiment and um they do the thing where they put the flowers on the wings and and one of them dies and it, it just it gives you a real kind of nice slice of life of what it was like to be in this regiment so well you know. With that, we enjoyed it. I will just address these last few questions and then yep. we'll wrap things up. So Lisa Loftus is saying, uh, did the mum ever get her daughter back? So referencing what you were saying. Yes, yes, she did. Yes, I think she Lisa, did. if we hadn't answered that, Lisa would have been, wouldn't have slept tonight. So, honestly, yeah. honestly I, 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 I want to say to you, you know, and you can read. You can read more, more about of it. I'll hold up my copy as well. Yeah, get the book, I, I mean, I'm really right. just like giving you sort of like the barest. And yeah, I, I do appreciate that it was not as linear a narrative as it could have been. No problem at all. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, Leslie. 
Uh, was there a difference in pay between the men and women? I think Luba said the snipers were paid the same as the men. Is that I the same? Believe they, I believe the pay rate was was identical. Yeah. Okay. And another slightly more um, a complicated question, but uh, it's it's Gary August. Does Elizabeth agree that the inclusion of females in the Soviet forces turned the tide of the war? I don't think so. Um, I mean, they they just basically like threw people at the. So there were how many? How many? I, I I will be making up numbers. Okay. I mean, they may have lost the Soviet. Uh, Union may have lost as many as 40 million people in the war. Yeah, it's somewhere um, between 30 and 50 million people are still arguing over it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I'm trying to remember now how many women, I think it was about a million um, women were in the, the Soviet armed forces during the war. And th when we're talking those kind of numbers, I don't actually think that it it's enough to have turned the tide of the war and it also um, connected. It really helped i don't want to say they didn't help with peter's question clear they excelled at harassment and sleep deprivation morale sapping role did their bombing have any material distraction or personnel losses and i think I mean, it's yes a good question peter but it, it's we've talked about a lot on this channel is but it's that how you measure things beyond the the obvious result it's like the combined bomber offensive there's the morale aspect there's the inspire how much it inspired people in factories how much it inspired recruiting so i think to me a story like these female aviators can't just begin and end with did they actually have any material distracted the enemy forces that's one way of looking at it, but you've got to pile on all these other aspects of of the propaganda element the fear the germans had of it this yeah, and I think when you get to that point, it's a it's a more complicated question. But they they made a difference. So I I, I would add to that um, that part of the reason they were allowed to start these regiments at all was because by having um, you know by being able to say, oh yes, look, we've got all these women who are who are flying aircraft and who are and who are fighting for our motherland, they were able to placate the many thousands of women who weren't being able to do that. So it was, in terms of propaganda, it was actually a very smart move because nobody could say, well, they're not doing anything with all the yeah. wonderful women pilots that we have. They could say, oh, yes, we are. Look at Marie, look at Raskova's regiments. Um, and I think that was actually politically maybe um, a more important issue than the actual manpower or women power, you know, of that, of adding to um, the, the military strength. Um, but also I, I wanna remind you that men were doing this exact same job with the exact yeah. same effect. Um, so it was one of the many strategies that it, the Soviet- it, it's, always the, it's always the same thing. Any The minute anyone says, this is the thing that won the war, is this is the turning point, any binary statement like that automatically becomes problematic yeah you know, the war was won by lots and lots of things that came together so 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 singling out any particular aspect of it is always problematic which is why we don't do it on the channel but just want to read a couple of things people have said about the presentation leslie's saying great presentation elizabeth and woody when is elizabeth coming back for another show mike is saying a fascinating presentation well told thank you elizabeth and thank you once again David Levine, I have been moved to tears by this tremendous presentation. Pardon my sentimentality. I just wanted to share this. Um, and great presentation. People are buying the book, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I'm, I think maybe a panel discussion with you, Luba, a couple other people then talk about the role of women generally and what conclusions you've cut, you've come and, and how it's changing, because that's the 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 whole historiography aspect of the soviet role is changing you know you wrote this book way before uh, the events in ukraine the, the how the west is perceiving the, the yeah. soviet's role was different then it's different yeah. now it'll be different in 10 years time and i think this how how you set about explaining these complicated things to a younger audience is also worth discussing as well because it is it is you know, can can we this is a rhetorical question can we now celebrate these women when we're now looking at what russia is doing today is it can, can you can you celebrate the past and be pro have problems with the present of course you can uh, but it's complicated it, i mean it certainly is complicated um i i you know the moral dilemma of oh, do i want to talk about do i want to talk about these women right now but yes i do because first of all i wrote the book yeah. <laughs> you know it's there wasn't a war going on when I wrote the book. And yeah. second of all, second of all, you know, they did a thing in the past 
um, you know, do do we does that mean that anytime we've we take exception to anything, we have to stop examining yeah. history? Yeah. I, 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 you know, it's 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 hard, but I don't and think we're rational either. blame I mean, these I, people I, for what's going on now. The Red Army is not entirely Russian. We did the same thing with Prit last night mm -hmm. about the Ukrainian World War One team. Yeah, I mean, a ton of you, a ton of these people were Ukrainian, so yeah. So it's 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 yeah. a complicated thing. But we will bring things. Then I'll remind you again, viewers, you can get links to Elizabeth's website below, and you can find her books on various of your favorite bookstores and etc. etc. and audibles and blah blah blah. Um, folks, I'm back twice tomorrow, once on World War II TV. Uh, Hugh Davies coming on talking about Lend-Lease and Soviet trucks. And then uh, later on, John McManus is joining Lucy and I on World War I TV to talk about the U.S. involvement in the First World War. So a busy wait day for me tomorrow. Elizabeth, I will invite you back again to either continue this conversation or do something else, talk about um, bringing history to young people. But um, have you enjoyed talking to our, our, our band of viewers? Oh, my gosh, yeah. Yeah, and, and as usual, I'm, I'm sorry that... I can't answer more questions it's, oh, you know just it's go on and on and on and 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 i i love hearing people's opinions and and curious curious Brilliant. well i will extend the invitation again but thank you everybody this is paul Woodard for world war ii tv saying i'll see you all next time cheers everybody bye